Hi, my name's Bob Greenier. I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So uh, this presentation I'm calling Lena in a Can. It's a series of two presentations that I will be doing. And I'm calling it Near Instant Transmutation of Tungsten Using a Mars Gas. Basically, I have a phenomenological hypothesis to what I'm um, talking about today. And I, I came up with this a, a couple of years ago when just the, the weight of evidence in various uh, Lena experiments um, started to mount up. And then I found out that most of it had already been suggested before, which is great. <laughs> So essentially, I'm saying the process likes to fit things into a small box. I like to explain things so my children who can understand. <laughs> um, and therefore, energetically advantageous products will be favored. Okay? Uh, the, the statistical guide, as far as I'm concerned, for products outside uh, of the energy yield in, in the, 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 the point above is the crustal abundance. Uh, since the driving processes are ubiquitous, friction, fracture, compression, cavitation, sound, electrical discharge, etc. I believe this is, we've got four and a half billion years worth of experiment, which we can look at in the crustal abundance. The processes like to reduce input materials to alpha particles. It's not a black hole, it's a thing about the size of a, 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 an alpha particle with lots of alpha particles in it. Um, uh, products are largely alpha conjugate nuclei, including alphas, with carbon being the prime output if it's not so intense. Um, oxygen, silicon, calcium, they're very common. Uh, energetic alphas can lead to transmutation, um, and uh, the production of protons and tritium are due to fermionic nuclei. They can't live in the Bose condensate, so they get spat out. So this is why you see tritium in Lena, and the next one is helium. So. <laughs> um, and uh, other fermionic nuclei are favored, like 23 sodium, uh, 27 aluminium. We've observed 61 nickel on Hutchison samples, and that's been uh, supported by the 23, uh, ICCF 23 presentation of Irina Savatomova in corona discharge, and 207 lead for synthesized elements in an experiment, uh, as they don't fit inside the condensate. So um, I'm not the only person to observe this. Um, uh, Leclerc observed this at his company Nanospire with his partner, uh, where they used both laser cavitation, induced cavitation, and sound induced cavitation. And they saw, saw stellar synthesis uh, all the way up to uranium and transuranics, which then fissioned back and they got the radioactive products. This is what you can do in cavitation. If you want to kill yourself, do cavitation Lenner experiments, okay? Uh, particularly hydrosonic pumps. About an hour exposure nearly killed him, him and his partner. And it was calculated by Alexander Shishkin in his cavitator that the flux of strange radiation would kill most humans in one hour. For, it won't kill you immediately. It'll be a little while later. <laughs> but the, the emissions are, are that intense. And so you can see in uh, the right-hand side are various strange radiation tracks and uh, exotic vacuum object imp impacts uh, that he observed. And sometimes he observed them a great distance from his apparatus. This is uh, Stanislav Adamenko, and he worked with uh, Vladimir Vysotsky uh, at the print Proton 21 Labs. They did 600 man years, as far as I understand, to produce a 700 page book on nucleosynthesis. And they basically discharged 300 joules at 1 tenth C into a target. They do, used all of the metals, <laughs> and they synthesized all of the elements from whatever metal they started with. <laughs> um, but more often than not, I'm going too fast, Santa, I'll slow it down. Um, more often than not, they synthesize lead. And the reason I believe that is, is because it's the last non, it's the last stable element. So everything tries to work towards lead. And if there's any lighter nuclei, it ends up synthesizing things in the middle through an almost real time uh, fission and fusion uh, reaction. Anyway, the, the, the apparatus was moved to the US and I think it's now at um, Brookhaven National Laboratory and they're looking at using that apparatus for making fusion. And I, th I think George Miley is involved actually with that. Okay, so um, we're going to step back in time here to Langmuir because we're talking about the um, sort of disappearance of tungsten. And uh, it, from 1909 onwards, he, really, uh, he found that there was a 7,000 times uh, production of gas based on the volume of the filament in his experiments. And he asked General Electric to give him five years to study it. Um, uh, th this uh, was thought to be potentially because there's water on the inside of the glass, and that um, was evolved. It went on the hot filament. This produced tungsten oxide, and it produced atomic hydrogen. When you've got atomic hydrogen in this scenario, according to Matsumoto, you start to synthesize 
uh, itonic clusters, which are micro ball lightning, and these will start fissioning the uh, tungsten. And you'll see later the potential gaseous fissioning products, which is one of the most uh, prevalent in our experiment. Should be, but we need to do that test. So um, many of you may know about this, these ch chaps, uh, Gerald Went and Clarence e. Irion. I don't know uh, if I said that right, I apologize to them. Um, but essentially they uh, took um, metals and they exploded them and they thought they observed, particularly uh, with uh, tungsten, the production of alphas. Uh, and this is very interesting because you'll see a repeating pattern here. Uh, positively identified was the strong yellow line of helium. The appearance of helium and the absence of hydrogen is interesting for two reasons. In the first place, it seems to dispose of the objection that helium arose from the gas remaining in the wire. For in that case, hydrogen should also have been visible. For it was probably originally present in the wire. I'll cut to the end. Rutherford was also unable to detect hydrogen from bombardment with alpha rays of carbon, oxygen, magnesium, silicon, and sulfur whose weights are multiples of four. Though he did detect it with boron, nitrogen, fluorine, sodium, phosphorus, aluminium, whose weights are not such multiples. So you can get the emission of a proton from a high energy alpha hitting these uh, non-bosonic, non-alpha particle conjugate nuclei. So the idea that, that Piantelli sees these protons come out and many researchers have observed uh, production of protons in their experiment you're seeing this work from the 1920s or whenever it was, 1932, or probably before. Anyway, at the time, the neutron wasn't uh, understood there. They have a thing in here about how tungsten is exactly 46 times the atomic weight of helium. But if you look at the you know, simple atomic model, then you would have a different opinion about <laughs> whether it could occur, as uh, he observed. Now, there is an Australian uh, called Simon Brink, and he presented at ICCF 21. And he did many explosion arc uh, discharges from capacitors uh, with water. And here is tungsten. And tungsten synthesizes iron, copper, zinc, zirconium, and all the elements there. I'm going to focus on zirconium because this is my understanding of what's going on. But what you are synthesizing in these experiments is always HHO. Because you've got water, you've got electricity, you're going to get essentially the, the, the scenario to produce uh, oxyhydrogen gas, because you're going to get some splitting of the water. And I think a lot of people have missed this. So the exchange reactions uh, with oxygen, there's an online calculator. It's free for anyone to use. It has 1.6 million calculations in there. It's near incident. You can do cascade reactions, fusion, fission, and tra uh, transmutation with or without cold neutrinos. It's free to use, um, but you type in oxygen-16 and tungsten isotopes, and the top of the list is it's synthesizing zirconium with 117.485 million electron volts. And that is the smallest box. The more, most energy is the thing that, gives, that is produced when it's in the smallest box. And you see zirconium. And in many Lenner experiments, historical, if you use these calculators, you'll see that the products they see are the ones that fit into the smallest box. OK, this is Mizuno. He had his, uh, his what a, a singularity, like Pons and Fleischmann's singularity. And uh, it was with tungsten, potassium carbonate, and water. And the tungsten blew up, and it produced, by the thermal heating rate of heating of the water volume, uh, a COP of about 800, which is what they calculated. But the, I've done a video on this, you can go and look at it, and the, the products are easily calculatable using the calculator. So I need to give a grounding to those people who don't know the background from where I'm coming from. The, the hundreds of people out there that watch me talk about these things on a day-to-day -day basis, they've already had this history. So I'm gonna give you the potted nugget of what you need to know to, to understand where I'm coming from. And you can go and explore these pieces of research in your own time. So I think one of the most seminal papers in this whole field is by Aritzke et al. And it is, it, again, exploding a foil. In fact, they did a, a range of foil explosions. And uh, it's in water, and therefore they will be creating HHO. By the way, just that's aside, because that's what we're going to be talking about with the Mars gas. Um, the transmutation of titanium, almost entirely 48 uh, titanium, was to all of the elements you would expect, 
um, from titanium, if you'd run the calculations. Um, they produced ball lightning, which you may or may not be able to see um, here. Oh, no, I'm good. Uh, here, this is a ball lightning above the reaction chamber, okay? And the Soviets in the, in the 80s worked out that they could transmit vast amounts of electricity on eight mon micron wires to like 25 kilowatts of light bulbs from a Tesla uh, uh, apparatus. And, and other people have replicated this phenomena. Um, and actually Matsumoto did a paper, I think in 1994, uh, about a new type of electrical current. And he says that the, the ball lightning travels along the wire, but then it gets excited and it comes out. The interesting thing is the ball lightning after a few milliseconds, microseconds, milliseconds, I think it is, it decays into smaller units, which are themselves self-organized. And so that's but worth bearing in mind. And then he also detected monopoles or pseudomonopoles um, by using iron 57 uh, foils at 0.7 meters from this enclosed explosion. And uh, the fine constant, one had a north pole on it, on the back of it, another one had a magnet with a south pole on it, and uh, they had a control in another room without a magnet on it. And the control showed the normal uh, NMRI signal, and the one with the N and the S respectively had opposite signals by about the same amount. Uh, and then the other thing, they observed strange radiation uh, here, and they observed uh, con what we call condensed plasmoids, uh, to give a nod to Winston Bostick, who first named them. So in this one paper, you have something that is doing transmutation. It is effectively fast electrolysis. Uh, it is um, producing ball lightning. It's producing magnetic monopoles. It's producing strange radiation. It's producing condensed plasmoids. This is an absolute no-brainer if you want to understand what's going on in Lena. And it's an easy experiment. Well, it's well defined. Um, and that's not the case for many experiments out there. Um, he later went on to discuss um, the failure of the RBMK-1000 reactor at Chernobyl as a production uh, from the, gener the turbine four producing a vast quantity of magnetic monopoles as, as it did back EMF. And that went into the water. And um, th this caused uh, the, the observations, particularly the observation of the odd glowing. And he, he cites this as oxygen, which is highly paramagnetic. In fact, the colder it is, the more, more the magnetic susceptibility is. Anyway, so it binds to the, the oxygen and it changes the energy levels in the, the oxygen. Um, and this was observed also by Xu Wenzhu during three body alignments. It changed the spectra outputs of elements. Okay, so it, I, I haven't got time to go into it. You can go and read it in your own time, um, but it's, it's also a very good paper. Okay, then the third grounding one is Bogdanovich et al., and they've been doing what's called plasma flow discharge experiments. So you have a water flow here, and they do the plasma through it, and they create a various amounts of ball lightning in the red, various colors that you get ball lightning. He also gets toroidal forms, as well, and some are white and some are black. And the amazing ones are the black ones where you can see the plasma discharge behind it and even the hole through the toroid, but you don't see the actual, it's just a black thing. So um, he found that in these experiments, which they've been doing for nearly 20 years, when Shishkin's group at Dubna started observing these things, um, which they uh, call J radiation after Barkler, um, who couldn't explain them having done characteristic x-rays. He spent the rest of his life trying to work it out. Um, th these are um, magnetic monopoles. So you've got uh, probably a north and south coming together here. It's not a coincidence that he ringed this one. And I'll tell you why. Because so, so this is produced from this plasma flow discharge. And so you've got a mixture of them all flying around. In the second experiment over here, they used a beam line high energy electrons into a conversion target, producing gamma and uh, beta particle, uh, gamma and x-rays. Then they went through a, a, a strong magnet to get rid of the electrons. And so you've got a shadow there from the x-rays and, and the gamma rays from the, um, from the conversion target. And above and below, you have the monopoles, okay? And the interesting thing is they've highlighted the fact that on the one side of the magnet, you've got two coming together back to back. This is not a coincidence that they've done this. It's, it's what I call an Easter egg when we used to do software programming. 
Okay, so uh, Perovskichov um, was able to, in an experiment, was taking water in a sealed container and having a 0.4 Tesla magnet underneath it. He was able to collect these things from standard sunlight. He thought they were a new type of photon, but anyway, they're not. Um, and I don't know what's going on with that, but anyway. Um, so they have the same structure. So this is, you can do this experiment. And he used a laser to stimulate the production of them, having collected them for 10 days by putting a, like a Petri dish into the sun with a bank of four Tesla, uh, uh, 0.4 Tesla uh, neodymium magnets underneath. And he observed this on standard uh, sort of black and white photographic film and, and also inside the film. Okay, so that's the Bogdanovich one, so you can see. I haven't got any of the Shishkin um, ones, but this is my hypothesized structure for it. And essentially what you're seeing is like the slice through the mushroom. And in fact, when I read Perovskichov paper, which I discovered later, um, it was like he, he calls them uh, mushrooms in, in Russian. So Bogdanovich, again, this is unbelievably significant as well. Um, because Ken Shoulders said that the, the plasmoids can hide in metals indefinitely. They can be reactivated and they can be blown up at a long time later. And what they've done, <clears throat> they, they are having seen all this other work, they decided in 2018-19 to try and see if they can record the plasmoids post-experiment. And this is published, it's peer-reviewed, and um, uh, you can see up here, this is a toroidal plasma, plasmoid. It's traveling across the surface, I think at 10 microns. This is two days after the discharge, right? And when I talked about this on my YouTube channel, some guy came to me and said, oh, we're in the military, we were seeing these things on beam, uh, electron beam uh, interactions with aluminum landing gear. And to cut a long story short, they were still there two months later. Now, that might seem a long time, but we managed to reactivate them in the line reactor nine months later to produce x-rays. And then I told that to the Russians. They said, ah, oh, that's nothing. We did it 18 months later, and we just put it into sunlight with a bismuth uh, uh, salt that they did. So these things do stay long, and hopefully tomorrow I will show you one under the SEM, and it's like a little spaceship. It's just fantastic, and I need to investigate that further. Um, what you're seeing over here is a cluster. So they like to cluster together, and they orbit around their own orbits, and they orbit around the collective orbit. And this can either spin around on the surface, or it can roll on the surface, interacting with the surface and leading tra leaving tracks. But um, they hypothesized that this is the basic structure of ball lightning, and I would agree with them. Uh, and I hope for, hopefully at the end of tomorrow you will agree with me agreeing with them. <laughs> okay. So I have to say Ken Shoulders here, um, because it's quite important, because people don't think. Feynman finally gave in and said, yes, it can do it. But um, people instinctively say electrons can't cluster, because some, some textbook told them to. So, so anyway, uh, now electrical engineering does not let charge disappear, but it does in this multiple toroidal form. You see, an EVO is a cluster. It's one way of thinking of it, it's of electrons. And you know, and physics says, yeah, well, you can, this is from a, a, an interview, but basically he's saying, effectively, these particles are like a, a condensate of, of electron charges that then just only express the single charge. And he was able to get 10 to the 23 charges to express a single charge in a large thing at like uh, solid densities. And for me, that explains the, the, the black, uh, toroidal structure in the plasma flow discharges that cannot transmit light. It's like a solid electron cluster. So it, it's basically can't, the light can't go through it. It enshrouds stuff, and this is going to be important as we go through this presentation and the next presentation. It enshrouds stuff. This is all written in some of these things on the web. When it enshrouds, thing, enshrouds things, it can allow them to disappear. It does make atoms disappear in my laboratory work. Well, that's interesting, you know, because when they disappear, I can transport all this stuff through to somewhere else, and it reappears there. That's teleportation. So it does that very nicely. And I have seen that in multiple experiments, and I'm not the only one. So uh, this is talking about the fact that there's these rules that are made, um, but when you look at the experiments and you do them repeatedly, it's impossible that these things have to be conserved. Something is going on that allows what, is, what you can actually observe. So this is just comments on that. Okay, so the next person is uh, Takaaki Matsumoto, and he talks about electronuclear collapse. And I'm going to cut right to the chase. This was pre presented in ICCF 7 in Toronto, uh, sorry, in Vancouver, uh, 1998. And so, very, very simple experiments. This really is extremely simple. Water, 
potassium hydroxide, one millimeter lead electrode, the same voltage that comes out of your, your Italian sockets roughly, and, and a, a few milliseconds of pulses. It's producing, because it's AC, definitely it's producing a HHO. It wasn't considered at the time. This is why this is contextual with what I'm talking about here. So um, they have these lead spheres that are, are synthesized, um, and he also had a lead torus, but anyway, most of them are lead spheres, and that is what happens mostly. Uh, and out of the pole, you get a plume of carbon. Again, this is the sphere at the bottom here, and this is the massive plume of carbon that's coming out of the sphere. And uh, if you can imagine, you've got 204, 206, 207, 208 nucleons in there, that's all 12 or 13 or 14, yeah? Probably not 14, because it doesn't like to produce anything radioactive. The thing is that in these experiments, it, there is absolutely no carbon in the starting material. None at all. Light water, lead, potassium hydroxide. And they tend to produce, this is a carbon plume coming out, and they produce hollow balls. And I will show you one that we've seen in a completely different system that looks pretty much identical to, to these structures with the hollow ball. And he produces <coughs> lots of carbon films. And this was his conclusion in 2001. He concluded his work in 1999. He was a nuclear scientist all his life and tried to try find ways to deal with nuclear radiation. My three ring, three ring traces, these are strike marks of ball lightning, um, uh, were products of those simultaneous explosions. Here I have to apologize to the readers for insufficient assignment made in a previous publication that he thought it was quad neutrons that were in there and they collapsed and they produced the energy. He says, it was made clear by later experiments that clusters that collapsed were atomic clusters that could have a diameter of hundreds of micrometers and involve much more nuclei. Very amazingly, it was also found later that the ring products consisted of conventional elements, mainly carbon, not dependent on the collapsed materials. This process is what we call nuclear regeneration. So he has this thing called the NATO model. And this is his image here uh, from Fusion Technology 1993. And what you see in here is what he calls the dough ball center. And he said right from the outset, I think in 1990 or 1991, that this was a, a mesh that was containing positrons, electrons, and neutrinos. And this collected nuclei and it fermented them, that's, that's what natto is like a dough ball and you ferment it to, to come up with the other atoms that come out of it. But he later realized that they can, if they get too intense, they can just collapse and you, you get complete destruction of the baryons and they come out and into new elements. So why am I saying this? Because in the apparatus you see on the right here, this is a vibrator and it's vibrating at 179 hertz. But I wasn't going to accept that it was just that low frequency, so I brought a hydro hydrophone here, and I had a 384 kilohertz mic. And yes, there are lots of ultrasonics going on there. For whatever, whatever reason, this motor might be creating some harmonics or whatever, but there are ultrasonics. And on the plates, we found uh, a number, this is a, a selection, of these structures, and I have to thank uh, Dr. Felix Schulkman uh, for uh, putting this graphics together for me. And uh, we, they're, they're of the same order, uh, scale of structure, and they have this uh, mesh going on. And in fact, our, ours here look more like the drawings in his paper from 1993. So it's not fair to talk about HHO without talking about Yule Brown, um, and specifically his work on radiation remediation. So I'm gonna read this here. The most startling claim by the inventor in the press is that the gas produced in his process can reduce nuclear and toxic waste to harmless carbon. Using a slice of radioactive americium, Brown melted it together on a brick with small chunks of steel and aluminium. Those two elements are very important for the process. After a couple of minutes under a flame, the molten metal set up an instant flash. That, for me, is when it gets to the point of coherence and nothing Nothing in this planet and this universe can deal with that. When it's at that level, it, all matter collapses. 
After a couple of minutes under the flame, the molten metal set up an instant flash. Brown says the radiation destroys the radioactivity before heating and mixing with other metals, blah, blah, blah. And that was in Clean Energy in 1991-92. This was demonstrated to politicians. I think it was a Caltech. And it was replicated because the environmental health came in and said, you've just thrown a radiation all around the room. They couldn't find anything. And they did it there in front of, he did it then again in front of him. But there wasn't any sufficient analysis. But I hope by the end of this presentation, you will be able to accept that what he observed is a real thing and you can do it. So this is the vibrator. I've slowed it down. This is, I think, maybe eight times slowed down. And uh, it's normally, um, titanium plates, but sometimes for his transmutation, he plates them with palladium, okay? When he's producing the Amasa gas, he um, also uh, does alternate voltages, potentials on each plate. Here is the marks. Now you might think, oh, they're just some rust spots, but I can tell you they are where the uh, nodes of the uh, cavitation are, are focusing their energy. And it's incredibly fault tolerant, this technology. It doesn't really matter very much how you make the plates. Because they've got resonant modes that way, they've got resonant modes that way, and they've got resonance modes that way. And somewhere in this huge parameter space, it always finds somewhere to settle. <laughs> it's wonderfully um, beautiful in that respect. And you will see this structure in Matsumoto's work. And this is a, a, uh, um, a hydrodynamic uh, vortex, it's two together. Um, and they cruise like, produce like a half soliton, and you get intense uh, compression at the center, and the products you can't come out, you can see this torus, is, it's even got the twist left on it as it died. Uh, this one's just impacted. But we, we've seen this in magnetohydrodynamics, and I'm gonna show you an example when we expose a Mars gas onto the tungsten. These are the other structures that we observed on the vibrator plates. This is not one producing HHO or the um, Mars gas. But each of these were observed by Matsumoto. Not so much the strange radiation track down here, but the, these are the ring traces equivalent to Matsumoto's observations. And this is when a ball lightning comes in and it sits halfway. And what you are seeing here is the double layer. This is the coherent, from the coherent matter out to the end of the co where it can affect the material, 50% in. And tomorrow I will show you how this rips matter apart. It's, it's spectacular when you see it and recognize it. Um, this, he called these structures um, uh, itonic uh, clusters of uh, hydrogen and it, hydrogen frost. I'm not sure they are, and I would like to go back to this sample and see if this is actually a diamond precipitate. Um, but I take his word for it at the moment. He said it was uh, some ultra-dense hydrogen crystals. And uh, so it would be nice to uh, determine that. And we will talk about this particular trace in terms of live video of these production of these traces. So on a palladium coated one, those were on a steel plate, you have this figure of eight. This is a typical spot with your hydrodynamic vortex. In the center, you have diamond or, or carbon, and it always has a bit of nitrogen uh, impurity. I think it's something left over from what's left of when it gets there. <laughs> and then you see here, um, you the red in this vortex here, these vortices, uh, is uh, magnesium, and that is double carbon. And the uh, blue here is chromium, which is double magnesium. So at the core, you have carbon. On the outside, you have double carbon. On the outside of that, as, as the pressure gradient changes, you have quad carbon. This is some indium foil we put into that vibrator that you just saw for 10 minutes. I wanted to see if the, the exotic vacuum objects, these, these uh, toroids, uh, impacted it, because it's a very soft material, and if there was any transmutation. And yes, uh, and you can see, maybe you can't, but in the center, it's got calcium in the center, and then around that, you've got silicon, uh, and around that, you've got iron, and then cesium was in the electrolyte, the indium is the material it was on, oxygen's obviously everywhere, nitrogen's everywhere, and, um, uh, carbon is in, in the overall cluster, okay? So, and this is an experiment, you literally put it in, and uh, when, when I put it in, you know how indium is very soft, right? You pull it out, it was hard. It, it was really hard, right? Right, <laughs> George, I mean, you were there. <laughs> um, 
So this is the experiment that we did for the tungsten exposed to HHO, or in this case, a much more advanced HHO. We showed that all of the observations by Mats Matsumoto are created by just the vibrator. The strange radiation, the, the, the circular tracks, the, the clusters of hydrogen, and, and the NATO models. This, I believe, is what's causing the very dense gas that doesn't come out of a glass. You can put it in a glass, and I believe that this is why he can store his gas for, I think it's now 13 years, and then use it in a standard steel de uh, uh, gas canister at 10 bar. You can't really do that with hydrogen. A couple of years, and it's, it's done in Brittleman, right? So here's the experiment. You can see George with the vacuum cleaner. We had 20 minutes to come up with an experimental design, and I thought, well, no one's ever captured the particles coming off. I wanted to capture the particles coming off and put them in a separate container and see if the, the, the evolved particles had the same transmutations that I didn't know what I would see on, on the actual tungsten, should there be any transmutations on there. So you can see the high-speed camera. It's not at high speed. We've got the high-speed thing. And you can see George there. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Roshin Amaza here, and that's me being the silly person right in front of the flame. So you will see how long this experiment is, and then we will look at some of, some of the transmutations that occurred. So this is the gas, and we will talk about later how um, when you do a spectrum of the gas at this point, it's almost entirely OH radicals. You don't see any hydrogen spectrum, you don't see any other gas spectrums, just OH radicals, which can maze. Those astrophysics physicists among you know that this self-mazes and produces microwave, but anyway, I believe that's critical to what's going on in this process. Okay, I want to show you the whole experiment, you, don't, you haven't got long to wait. <laughs> okay. So it's pretty much over. You see how George's hand is so steady with that long pole? The bar is thoriated, 2% thoriated tungsten. Okay. I wanted to have the radioactive element in there to see if it, it changes because um, Parkamov says it doesn't affect alpha decay nuclei. Yes, it's a standard welding. Uh, Thing. So there we go, that's the experiment over. You can all do that one. So at Tokyo University, I think in 2003, they analyzed the gas and you can see there was 0.28% atomic hydrogen in there, even after it's been stored for a long time. Um, but it also has this 0.8% uh, of uh, hydroxy radical. Um, and note, it's not just that. If, if you have the, the, um, uh, the water going on the... Um, uh, material or the hydroxy radical and the oxygen is taken away because you've got it now hot and it goes to tungsten oxide, you then got atomic hydrogen in there. So it's synthesizing atomic hydrogen when it's interacting with the metal through the oxidation process in part, just as was observed by Irving Lamier from 1909 to, uh, to, to 1914. So this is in this room, there's my colleague Slobodan Stankovic who was standing over here <laughs> uh, at ICCF 22. And this is him showing the spectra from the unimpinged uh, gas, and it's almost entirely uh, the OH radical. So this is our tungsten welding rod. This is an analysis of it, and you see, obviously, there's some carbon contamination, there's an oxide on there, and you've got a bit of thorium, which you would expect. This is the surface, one section of the surface, <clears throat> and it would appear that the, whatever is going on, it goes into the surface, and it produces this condensed matter state, in my view, and it, then it grabs a load of tungsten nuclei, and then it fissions. And in every single location, we observe calcium. It's the only thing that's in every single thing, place you look. And this is very interesting, because if you take the isotopes of calcium, and 180 is a rare isotope, it's 0.14%. But 182 and 184, the next two down, they com comprise 57% of natural tungsten. And they all fission to calcium isotopes and xenon. 
So the net, we, I would have done this last year had there not been the sniffles. Uh, we have a gas analyzer and we have yeah, the, a Yule Brown genuine HHO ga gas generator. And I would have looked to see if we can see the Xenon as the sister product. But anyway, this is what you get. It might be the Xenon fissions again. It was, it was the favored uh, gas of shoulders and to get fission energy. Uh, this is another area and you can see every single location has calcium. Uh, now, I told you I would come back to this hydrodynamic structure. Here I've got it as a magnetohydrodynamic structure, and you're going to see this on other examples where we are impinging the gas onto other metals. But you have the, the vortex, one always sits over another, and you have this other one over here. They, they, they can form this triplet. Uh, this, this is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, by the way. <laughs> well, that's what I call them. Again, uh, we've got uh, some samples here that's not so relevant. And there's the reactions again. So I'm looking around this sample, and you can see in particular places, there are concentrations that are higher than they are other places. And these are the same places as the same kind of structure that I presented in this place at ICCF 22 that was found in the seven-month reactor of Alexander Parkhamov, which I called the pretzel. And I said, in the future, this is going to be a very important structure. <laughs> And then I analyze this and I go, oh, there's one, and you're going to see more of them. Um, but th this is intense, intense magnetism. Intense magnetism. So this is the filter. And so you can see some particulates that have been caught in the um, polycarbonate or whatever it is, the uh, carbon and oxygen fibers. Um, and uh, you see the same uh, transmutation products, and you also see tungsten. I think the str strontium there is a band overlap. So I think we can ignore that. Interestingly, you don't see any thorium. And, hmm? Sorry, Bob. To be clear, is the filter from the Viking trainer? No. We put a brand new surgical filter that no one would have known what I was talking about, but I think everyone does now, <laughs> on the front head of the vacuum cleaner. And you saw it in the test. That's what George Eagley was holding. So I thought, no one's ever thought of doing this. It, it's important to know what's coming out. So you can see again here with all of the various elements, and they're all the elements that are synthesized on the metal. Um, this is an Indian that's used razor blades, a pet bottle, and some water, and a 12-volt battery to make his HHO with some potassium hydroxide. And out of the pet bottle, as out of this hypodermic needle, he's forming a coherent matter ball, a ball lightning, in the yellow state, very similar to the ones that we'll be talking about in the Vega experiment tomorrow. And what you're getting is you're getting a capillary instability, and that's for, yeah, causing uh, vortices to go around here that help the self-organization. And this is the same kind of capillary instability that you'll see when I show you the 10 yen coin. So this, for me, is a beautiful, beautiful experiment because we have very, very pure materials. We have uh, a PTFE, which is just fluorine and carbon. Okay? And on the right, we have very, very pure titanium. Okay, these are the things we're going to use with the Amasa gas. And this is the experiment. Blink and you miss it. That's it, done. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, there was this structure. Now, you, all, all around here, you can see a very, very stoichiometric, or whatever it is, the, the proper ratio of tungsten oxide. And for those that know the rainbow metal, they will know that different thicknesses of oxide will produce this rainbow color, okay? But otherwise, this is extremely pure tungsten. Uh, sorry, titanium, rather, titanium. And on this titanium, this is, this is one of the money shots, uh, not everywhere, but in a particular location. So a condensed plasmoid came into here, and we're gonna look at this in, in a different part. It exploded, and in fact, this is a piece of PTFE, which is somehow in the middle of the tungsten. A titanium, right? I'll get this right in a minute. Everyone makes that mistake. <laughs> now, what you see is these self-organized spikes that appear like, like they're somehow magnetically or electromagnetically repelling and attracting each other. And what you find is that at the bottom, you have nickel. A little bit further up, you have iron. A little bit further up, you have chrome. Then you have titanium, and then you have a carbon nanotube. Alpha conjugate nuclei. Here's some close-ups on them. You can see how pure this is. It's literally completely amorphous um, uh, titanium. 
and you've got all these structures. So typically you have a cone where the, the, it lays down the alpha particles in, uh, uh, in, in the structure, and then you get these carbon nanotubes coming out the end. And this was verified at, at, um, at Madison, Wisconsin University. We gave them the sample to look at as well. Oh, and the other thing is, these split ones, you can actually see the torus of, of the exotic vacuum object that builds the structure. So here we go, there's the calculations for you. The, the helium add to titanium goes to chromium isotopes, the helium to chromium isotopes goes to iron the isotopes, and the, the helium on the iron goes to the nickel. Okay? Or you can just shortcut it by taking the carbon onto the titanium. <laughs> so to, in context of what I've just shown you, the Solian patent from 1992, uh, uh, applied for in December 1992 and awarded in 1997, I think, it's now free to use. They use a refractory metal and an electron B mark. This is to add fuel in. But a super, it, 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 he nails pretty much every point you need to know about how to do, uh, in my view, this technology. Uh, a superconducting nuclear condensate is a magnetic liquid, a metal, nuclear fuel that generates energy with the generation of coherent radiation. Under conditions of nuclear phase transmutation, uh, transformations in the mass of the initial product, the combination of electromagnetic gravitational and nuclear reactions into it. This unifies the forces. This is how you cause the proton decay. Synthesis of elements from helium to iron and other heavy elements, in particular carbon, written in 1992, from research that was conducted during the Soviet period. In particular carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, potassium, calcium, sodium, aluminium, magnesium, silicon, and iron. These are the synthesized products. It does not matter what element you start with. He chose zirconium. I think that's a good choice. It's basically a low vapor pressure element that you need to use because that causes, basically the electron beam comes in, it causes electron bunching, that produces coherent electrons. They form the solitons of opposite magnetic charges. They cluster together, form the NATO model thing, and that collapses the material. So the Solian patent says this. The physical processes in the, in the substance are similar to those that occur in the superfluid, superconducting nuclear plasma of neutron stars. And there was a guy that stood here, uh, and he calculated that the pressure inside the torus of an EVO is equivalent to a pulsar, which is a type of neutron star. A Bayes, uh, I'm sorry I forget your name, I apologize to the person when they watch this. <laughs> Uh, obeys the laws of Bose condensate and acts as a classic coherent wave. We're going to be talking about that tomorrow. Therefore, it is dedicated, simul uh, sorry, detected spontaneously without chem chemical etching of the nuclear fusion product due to the implementation of coherent, ultra fast explosive crystallization. It consists of many fragments and dispersed areas in the form of ordered clusters of microcrystals which are separated from each other by voids. This is exactly what you saw in that six second experiment. Exactly. So what do we see? This is the other section. So you can see where the plasmoids come in. It's got the plasmoid trail behind it and this is the head. And when you look at this, this is how beautiful this experiment is. Because what you're seeing here is fluorine, fluorine sodium, aluminium, phosphorus, chlorine, so on. What are you seeing there? you are seeing alpha conjugate nuclei starting with a base of fluorine. Now, this experiment, this is where we saw none of these elements at all. We just saw titanium, pure, and then nickel, iron, chromium, uh, titanium, and then a carbon nanotube, right? And then over here, we see, starting with the fluorine that it captured into the exotic vacuum object, into this ball lightning, we then see the alpha conjugate nuclei starting with fluorine as the base. And so you can see it closer up here. And here are uh, the reactions. It stops here if you don't have neutrinos. And uh, you can, this, this is the next experiment. And bearing in mind, you have the eddy currents, the, uh, uh, the magneto hydrodynamic structure. This was George's selection. Well, actually, blink and you'll miss the experiment. There you go. So what you just saw there is exactly what Yul Brown was doing when he was remediating the waste. Now, what does it look like? You see the, the ring structure here, and this is carbon when you look under, and it's, it's taken away the carbon in the shape of the magnetic monopole. Then this is also a, a, a magnetic monopole, for, but a larger one from a different orientation. And it, is, it pretty much exactly matches the Alto University theoretically predicted 
structure of a direct ma ma magnetic monopole, uh, but it's in Eaton Live. Now, why is this interesting to me? Because ball lightning, when they blow up, they make a sm sulfurous smell. There's hundreds of years of this. Now, listen. This is this area where we just produce this thing. On one side, you see a hole. On the other side, you see something the same size, but it's not there. This is because you've got a spin field going around. One is ripping the material out and it's slamming it down in the overall ball lightning that's in this location. But in this structure here, on one side only, you see what I call these cobblestones. And on the cobblestones, you see copper oxide. And bearing in mind this could have happened after the experiment, I don't know. But what I told you about a roots curve is the ball lightning that he had a few milliseconds later, it produced smaller ball lightning that then drifted away. Right? This is the scale of a normal micro ball lightning. It's about uh, one, one micron, two micron. And it's rolling around like you were rolling a snowball. Now remember what I said about what Bogdanovich showed in the 2019, May 2019 paper. He observed plasmoids moving around two days after the experiment. If these are plasmoids in the sphere form, not the, the, sphere, sphere form, not the toroidal form, it's taking uh, oxygen 16 and oxygen 16 and making sulfur 32. This is with indium. Indium's interesting because it melts at 156.6. I chose that element because it has a, a, a large, the most of the isotopes, it's like 97% or something, is a beta isotope. It's a very long-lived beta isotope. But I wanted to see if it was very reactive when you get in introduction of coherent matter. And the interesting thing is, this gas, when you put it on, this lasted longer than the tungsten and the titanium. And it glows like an incandescent light bulb. Oh dear. Right, I'm going to go quickly. <laughs> I told you. So you can see here, this is slowed down eight times, but you can see the interaction. And it goes like jelly. I don't know if you just saw that there. It doesn't melt and fall off. It keeps its form, but it flow, flip, flaps around in the wind like a, like a rubber sheet. So here are the same kind of structures you saw coming out of uh, Matsumoto's balls. And they're from like volcanoes. So again, it's something that occurs partially under the surface. It does the collapse, it synthesizes the new elements, and it sprays it out. And above it, you get a head which puts out vaporized indium, and you get the indium crystals. And then behind it, you get the synthesized elements that spew out, just like as it did with Matsumoto. And again, it's mostly carbon. Here's the carbon film that Matsumoto observed in nearly all of his experiments, again produced from this indium interacting with HHO. There's some more examples. So my conclusion, you'll be pleased, I'm here. <laughs> So the Amasa vibrator appears to be able to bring about transmutation, both to the fluids, and I haven't gone into that, but it does, and metals in its environment, potentially providing a much needed solution to radioactively contaminated areas in the world. Amasa gas applied to metals appears to act as instant lena, causing large-scale transmutation of elements. Since Amasa gas appears to fission heavy elements, it should be suitable for treating dangerous products of the fission industry, but it doesn't appear to really affect alpha, the, the, the thorium gets left behind. And we've replicated that two weeks ago. So I want to thank uh, Alan Goldwater at Magic Sound Labs for providing the SEM and allowing me to sit there for 160 hours and 10 days. Uh, to all of the crowd researchers that made this possible and to the generous donations, uh, in particular to Charles and Show that made this trip possible for me to come here. And this is what a monopole does when it meets uh, baryons. So if you've got any questions, I don't know. <laughs> As a voucher, yeah, we can <laughs> sit down. So okay. We have got only five minutes for flesh, not for flesh. Flesh and flesh. Okay, thank you very much for this so very long presentation. Sorry. As a presentation. I have a simple question. Will this presentation be made available yes. to all of us? Firstly, the slides will, but with, with the videos will just be the holding frame, but I've just recorded it in two things there, so it's going to be available probably. It'll be on YouTube later today. YouTube later today. <laughs> okay, uh, Bob, the Omasa gas is similar to hydrogen torch or different? It's different. Hydrogen torch is just hydrogen, and you see you get recombination. It produces atomic hydrogen on the fly, as I've said, yes. going back to Langer, but it's different. Which one is, what is the peculiarity of gas? Well, I, I showed you it's structuring material to produce these natto things, 
which are able to do collapse and, and nuclei yeah. in, but it, that's even before you have the electrolysis. I showed you, uh, let me get the slide. I showed you the analysis. But there's also a mass analysis and you see clusters of buckyballs all the way up into very large sizes. The starting composition. Uh, the starting composition is, is, is uh, it has a, a problem, typically a potassium uh, hydroxide electrolyte and it, it, is, it is just water, just water. Um, let me, let me, I've got the um, composition uh, on the slide up here. And this is analyzed at Tokyo University, I think in 2003, uh, somewhere around here. Uh, somewhere. Keep, keep asking me a question and then I'll, I'll find it. Oh, okay. Maybe anybody interested, so we better uh, There. So uh, this, this laser-like cut we'll talk about tomorrow. It, I, it, the, when it cut that 10 yen coin, when you look at the boundary on it, it's literally sliced like a laser. And so I thought, this is impossible because it's copper. Why would it do this? And, and that's got me thinking about the maser. And now we've replicated it in the Vega experiments, which I'll show you tomorrow, where you've got copper and it just cuts out a perfect sphere, hemisphere. <laughs> yeah. No. In fact, HHO will burn like a gas. Some people get what they call the heavy gas. So if you pour the gas in here and you leave it for a day, a proportion will still be in there. The difference between a Mars gas is because I believe it's doing everything that a Mars showed and other people have showed by creating these clusters, which he calls electron, positron, neutrino clusters that are able to bind things together. You get more of the heavy gas and it's the heavy gas that do the work. Interestingly, some HHO researchers say that they get a flash of the good gas to begin with but they don't later. And I believe that's because of dissolved oxygen. Now, if you have his vibrator plates, the oxygen that's evolved at one electrode adiabatically compresses and goes into being dissolved oxygen. So it permanently keeps producing the good gas in a way that a static system won't. Or will do less, because the cavitation itself produces some vibration. A question from a layman here. Mm -hmm. You said that when both lightnings blow up, they then uh, you then smell so well, a sulf a, a, like a sulfur smell, yes. Sulfur smell, yeah. okay, sulfur smell. You've got the world's expert in ball lightning by the way there. <laughs> okay. So, I just, that was it, thanks. So there's a, there's a spectrum. Sulfur smell is, you know, something different. Than... Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a spectrum that's, um, it's on Wikipedia, it's the only spectrum that's public, and, and they observe silicon, they observe um, calcium and iron, and if you do the maths, and you start with nitrogen, you fuse two nitrogens, you get um, uh, silicon. If you fuse the silicon with the nitrogen, you, you, you get the uh, calcium and then you get the iron. And, and um, you know, that's how it's occurring in my view. There's the Abraham Dennis model, which they say it's coming out of the ground, but the ball lightning in Hestalen forms in the air, it's never touching the ground. Yeah. Yeah, but um, light has been so far without being suppressed. Um... <laughs> you wait till tomorrow. I, I'm. I, no, no, but, uh, you know that in Dublin State, I did Howard and Howard and Howard, like thousands of hours of SEM analysis on electrolysis, a polygon of heavy work, and uh, we were seeing these um, carbon blobs everywhere, literally. You will. Uh, you can see the thesis I've done uh, after loading for 12, uh, yeah, 12 hours, um, a big polygon chunk covered with carbon. I uh, ultrasonate, uh, did ultrasound on it, and uh, you will go back to my thesis. I'm very interested. Very, very here and Thank you. And also, you in, two, in May 2013, you observed the formation of nano diamonds on Francesca Cellani's uh, copper nickel wire. And there was no explanation for that, but it's easy. And when you see tomorrow, you'll know how it occurs. <laughs> so, as I understood, uh, the nano diamonds are no, that's part of it. No, so I, I'm going to read. Okay. Which are elementary 
particles and the monopoles, which are just construction of the current loops. It's a completely different situation. Well, these current loops are already discovered and uh, well, uh, this very convincing and uh, published many times, but it is not necessary uh, reason for the reaction, you know, or transmutation. Mm -hmm. So if you present uh, this thermal uh, driven experiment or mechanical experiment... Oh, oh no, this doesn't need to be thermal. So uh, that's great. Um, so the, I think Bogdanovich uh, refers to the pseudo-magnetic monopole of, of Dirac-like structure, this, this, okay, this and 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 he he. Not Sorry, what? So so are you talking about this? I, I, I agree. So, um, so how it's described is you, you, you get a vortex and it self-aligns and you'll see this in our experiment but on a very large scale. You get one this side, one this side and they, they try and arrange like that. And, and, but they're macro structures so you don't have to imagine and do equations, you can just see it. <laughs> um, but they, they go down into a vortex and they cohere at the point up there and that just happens and happens and happens and then it's like a propeller, some spray out the top. And what you end up with is it, you have either a north or south strong beam here and a suppressed beam up there. And so it's a pseudomagnetic monopole. It acts kind of like a monopole, but it's not like a pole that's magnetic charge and things come in from every angle. It's like that mushroom there. And it comes in from, um, it, there's more pole down here <laughs> than there is up there. And the, the, there's a guy um, who worked for Lockheed Martin, sadly he's departed, Boyd Bushman, and he cre created a, mag he got a patent, patent for a macro analog of this. So if you create um, a, a, a nor north facing in, 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 like a cube, as a basic structure, but one pole doesn't have, well, one face doesn't have a pole on it, you'll get a beam of north energy coming out in that direction. So that's how you can kind of think of it uh, as the structure is formed. And, and with, with the polar thing, you get two forms of the solitons and they produce a flux loop. And, in the, and I will show you tomorrow these flux loops and the synthesized elements in them. <laughs>